from his books, I imagined Bergot to be a frail, disappointed old man who had lost several of his children and never recovered. And so I would read, I would sing his prose to myself, more dolce, more lento perhaps, than it was written. And the simplest sentence spoke to me with a more tender intonation. Above all else, I loved his philosophy. I had pledged myself to it for life. It made me impatient to reach the age when I would enter secondary school and enroll in the class called philosophy. But I did not want to do anything else there but live according to Bergot's ideas exclusively. And had I been told that the metaphysicians to whom I would be devoting myself by then would not resemble him at all, I would have felt the despair of a lover who wants his love to be lifelong and to whom one talks about the other mistresses that will come later. One Sunday, as I was reading in the garden, I was disturbed by Swan, who had come to see my parents. What are you reading? May I look? Well, well, Bergot. Now, who told you about his books? I said it was Bloch. Ah, yes, the boy I saw here once who looks so much like the portrait of Mehmed II by Bellini. Oh, it's quite striking. He has the same circumflex eyebrows, the same curved nose, the same jutting cheekbones. When he, was, when he has a goatee, he'll be the same person. Well, he has good taste in any case because Bergot is quite enchanting. And seeing how much I appeared to admire Bergot, Swan, who had never talked about the people he knew, out of kindness made an exception and said to me, I know him quite well. If you would like him to write a few words in the front of your book, I could ask him. I did not dare accept his offer, but asked Swan some questions about Bergot. Could you tell me which is his favorite actor? Actor? I don't know, but I do know that he doesn't consider any man on stage equal to La Bernard. He puts her above everyone else. Have you seen her? No, monsieur, my parents don't allow me to go to the theater. That's unfortunate. You ought to ask them. La Berma in Phèdre, in Le Cid, is only an actress, you might say. But you know, I'm not much of a believer in the hierarchy of the arts. And I noticed, as had often struck me in his conversations with my grandmother's sisters, that when he talked about serious things, when he used an expression that seemed to imply an opinion about an important subject, he took care to isolate it in a tone of voice that was particularly mechanical and ironic, as though he had put it in between quotation marks, seeming not to want to take responsibility for it, as though saying hierarchy, you know, as it's called by silly people. But then, if it was so silly, why did he say hierarchy? A moment later, he added, it will give you a noble vision of it as any ma masterpiece. I don't know, really, as he began to laugh, the Queen of Chartres. Until then, his horror of ever expressing a serious opinion had seemed to me a thing that must be elegant and Parisian, and that was the opposite of the provincial dogmatism of my grandmother's sisters. And I also suspect that it was a form of wit in the social circles in which Swan moved, where reacting against the lyricism of earlier generations, they went to an extreme in rehabilitating those small, precise facts formerly reputed to be vulgar and proscribed fine phrases. But now I found something shocking in his attitude, in this attitude of Swan's towards things. It appeared that he dared not have an opinion and was at his ease only when he could, with meticulous accuracy, offer some precise piece of information. But if that was the case, he did not realize that to postulate that the accuracy of these details was important was to profess an opinion. I thought again of the dinner at which I was so sad because Mama would not be coming up to my room and at which he had said that the balls given by the Princesse de Lyon were of no importance whatsoever. But it was to just this sort of pleasure that he devoted his life. I found all this contradictory. For what other lifetime was he reserving the moment when he would at last say seriously what he thought of things? 
formulate opinions that he did not have to put between quotation marks, and no longer indulge with punctilious politeness in occupations which he declared at the same time to be ridiculous. I also noticed in the way Swan talked to me about Bergot, something that was, on the other hand, not peculiar to him, but shared at the same time by all the writer's admirers, by my mother's friends, by Dr. Du Boulbon. Like Swan, they said about Bergotte, he's quite enchanting, so individual. He has his own way of saying things, which is a little overly elaborate, but so pleasing. You don't need to see the signature, you know right away that it's by him. But none of them would have gone so far as to say he's a great writer. He has a great talent. They did not even say he had talent. They did not say it because they did not know it. We are very slow to recognize in the particular features of a new writer the model that is labeled great talent in our museum of general ideas. Precisely because these features are new, we do not think they fully resemble what we call talent. Instead, we talked about originality, charm, delicacy, strength. And then, one day, we realized that all of this is, in fact, talent. Are there any books by Bergotte in which he talks about La Berma? I asked Mr. Swan. I think so, in his slim little volume on Racine, but it must be out of print. There may have been a reissue, though. I'll find out. I can also ask Bergotte anything you like. There isn't a week in the whole year that he doesn't come to dinner at our house. He's my daughter's greatest friend. They go off together visiting old towns, cathedrals, castles. Since I had no notion of social hierarchy, for a long time the fact that my father found it impossible for us to associate with Madame and Mademoiselle Swann had had the effect, above all, by making me imagine a great distance between them and us, of it giving them prestige in my eyes. I was sorry my mother did not dye her hair and redden her lips, as I had heard our neighbors, Madame Sazura, say that Madame Swann did, in order to please not her husband, but Monsieur de Charles. And I thought we must be an object of scorn to her, which distressed me most of all, because Mademoiselle Swann, who from what I had been told was such a pretty little girl, and about whom I had often dreamed, giving her each time the same arbitrary and charming face. But when I learned that day that Mademoiselle Swann was a creature of so rare a condition, bathing as though in her natural element in the midst of such privileges, that when she asked her parents if anyone was coming to dinner, she would be answered by the syllables filled with light by the name of the golden dinner guest who was for her only an old friend of the family, Becker that for her, the intimate talk at the table, the equivalent for me of my great aunt's conversation, would be Bergot's word all, on all the su subjects he had not been able to broach in his books, and on which I would have liked to hear him pronounce his oracles. And that, lastly, when she went to visit other towns, he would walk along next to her, unknown and glorious, like the gods who descended among mortals. Then I was conscious both of the worth of a creature like Mademoiselle Swann and also of how crude and ignorant I, I would appear to her. And I felt so keenly the sweetness and the impossibility of my being her friend that I was filled with both desire and despair. Most often now, when I thought of her, I would see her in front of a cathedral porch explaining to me what the statue signified and which, and with a smile that said good things about me, introducing me to her friend, to Becco. And always the charm of all those ideas awakened in me by the cathedrals, the charm of the hills of Ile de France and the plains of Normandy cast its glimmers over the picture I was forming of Mademoiselle Swann. This was what is meant to be on the point of falling in love with her. Our belief that a person takes part in an unknown life which, with which his or her love would allow us to enter is, of all the love demands in order to come into being, what it prizes the most and what makes it care little for the rest. Even women 
who claim to judge a man by his appearance alone, see the appearance as the emanation of a special life. This is why they love soldiers, firemen. The uniform makes them less particular about her face. They think that under the breastplate, they are kissing a different heart, adventurous and sweet. And a young sovereign, a crown prince, may make the most flattering conquest in the foreign countries he visits without needing the regular profile that would perhaps be indispensable to a stockbroker.